fuck Dr. Fazio. And then, like, Dr. Ray came to the exam for us, and he was, like, an anomaly. It's the first time ever that he like, done something like this. He said it might be nice to be, like, this guy card and, like, profit or something. I like, said, thank you. So I bought a card and profit over the weekend. Do you guys want to all sign it, or do you want me to sign it on behalf of everyone? I have it with me, so if you all want to sign it, you can test it. I'll sign it. I'll sign it. Okay. So I'll test it around, okay. and then tomorrow we'll go to her, like, the doctor or whatever. Peter talked about before, which was 
And last we have corded tympani, which Peter also talked about, is sometimes called the corded tympani inertia. <clears throat> All right, so cranial nerve seven uh, is a nerve that has an awful lot of things to do, which you might have surmised from the overwhelming number of slides that are in this presentation. Uh, so we're gonna spend a lot of time covering functions of the facial nerve, but we'll spend an even longer time covering pathways of these different functions. So we have five different modalities within the facial nerve. It has special sensory, visceral sensory, somatic sensory, visceral motor, or parasympathetic, and somatic motor. So a special sensory, this, uh, the facial nerve is gonna provide the sense of taste to the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Our other types of sensory, so visceral sensory, uh, we're going to have visceral sensation from the mucosa of the nasopharynx and palate. And somatic sensory for a relatively insignificant part of the head, just a little part of your external ear uh, has somatic sensory innervation from the facial nerve. Visceral motor, uh, these were all talked about by Peter in passing yesterday. So this is gonna provide parasympathetic innervation to two of your salivary glands, the submandibular and sublingual glands, as well as the mucous glands within the uh, nasal cavity and oral cavity, uh, and also the lacrimal gland, which produces tears for your eye. And finally, somatic motor, which we've covered a little bit before. The facial nerve is in charge of all of the muscles of facial expression. A couple of other muscles, the posterior belly of the digastric and the stylohyoid as well as this little tiny muscle in the ear called stapedius. Um, so the digastric is a, an interesting muscle in that it gets innervation from two different cranial nerves. Which cranial nerve innervated the anterior belly of digastric? Which other cranial nerve did we discuss in detail? Trigeminal, which branch of the trigeminal? B3, remember B3 is the only one that has motor uh, fibers, so B3 does anterior belly of the digastric. <coughs> Probably not listed because the things it's providing visceral sensation to, uh, I can't imagine why they would ever really hurt. It's the like, tiny little glands in the nasopharynx. So it, it does provide visceral sensation, but not to a major structure. <clears throat> Back to a little bit of review of what we know about uh, the nervous system to help us understand what we're going to talk about today. So think way back to the abdomen. With what type of structures did postganglionic sympathetic fibers run with? Arteries. Arteries, right? Um, and we're gonna see the exact same thing in the head. So there are no uh, preganglionic sympathetics in the head. They're all going to synapse in that superior cervical ganglion, and then they're gonna ride along with the internal carotid and its various branches to get wherever it needs to go in the head. Okay, in the thorax and abdomen, where did the synapsing of preganglionic parasympathetics occur relative to target organs and relative to the central nervous system? We mentioned this a little bit on, uh, on Monday. So parasympathetics, did they synapse in discrete ganglia like we had? No, remember they mostly synapsed in the organ walls and then the postganglionics were super short. So here's where we have a slight difference between the head and the rest of the body in that the parasympathetics are all going to synapse in discrete ganglia, those four parasympathetic ganglia that Peter talked about on Monday. Uh, and then from there, they're going to take varying distances of postganglionics. Some of them are gonna synapse basically right next to that ganglion, others are gonna travel a little bit. So there's a, a slight difference here, yeah. Um, a second ago, did you say there's no preganglionic axons in the head? There's no preganglionic sympathetics. 
all of the sympathetic synapse in the superior cervical ganglion, which is in the neck, and then they are postganglionic in the head. Parasympathetics, we have both. Right. Uh, and last, in the thorax and abdomen, where were the sensory cell bodies located uh, relative to the central nervous system? So remember, they're in the dorsal root ganglia. So all of the sensory cell bodies are outside of the central nervous system, and the same holds true for cranial nerves. Each of the cranial nerves that has a sensory component will have an associated ganglia where the cell bodies are located. <clears throat> All right, on to the facial nerve itself. Um, so the facial nerve is going to come off the brain, and then it's going to enter into the internal acoustic meatus to exit out of the cranial cavity. It will take a fairly long bony tube pathway through the petrous part of the temporal bone, and it will ultimately exit out at the stylomastoid foramen. Um, so some of its fibers will pass out here, but a lot of uh, things are going to happen within that tube. It's going to drop off various nerves as it's passing through. Uh, but the largest portion of it will exit out of the stylomastoid foramen. And these are going to be the branches that you've already seen or attempted to see in, uh, in dissection. So all of these muscles of facial expression intervening branches. All right, so. Friday, we're going to take out the brains. Monday, we're going to look at the cranial cavity. Uh, and so you'll be able to find the internal acoustic meatus. And you will see that there are three individual nerves that are passing through it. One of those nerves is cranial nerve 8. The other two are parts of cranial nerve 7. So uh, cranial nerve 7 has two roots. There's a somatic motor root. And the other root is called nervous intermedius. Uh, and then the somatic motor root and nervous intermedius will join together once they're in the uh, sort of bony canal in the tetris part of the temporal bone to form the facial nerve proper. <clears throat> right, so here's a diagram of our cranial cavity. Here's our internal acoustic meatus. And we have three different bundles going through there. Uh, you're not going to be asked to differentiate the three bundles in the lab. Uh, they're not going to, they don't have like a set pattern because they get pushed around in there. But just know that those three different things are parts of two cranial nerves. <clears throat> All right, if we take our long list of things the facial nerve is responsible for, we can break it up into which root accomplishes which things. The somatic motor root is well named in that the only thing it does is somatic motor and then nervous intermedius in, in charge of everything else. So all of the sensory uh, modalities as well as the parasympathetics. <clears throat> all right, now we're gonna go through in painstaking detail the pathway that the facial nerve takes to various different parts of the head. After we've sort of built the framework here, then we'll come back and we'll trace each of those different modalities through this pathway, uh, which different twists and turns it takes to get to which different uh, parts of the head. So this looks like probably a mess to you right now. Hopefully it will look like less of a mess to you when you see it again in the very end of the lecture. Okay, so for the next uh, like 60 slides or so, the different font types are gonna tell you different things. So the sort of reddish color will tell you the names of nerves and ganglia. Purple will be spaces, either openings or, uh, or general cavities. And then anything else in black is anything other than those two categories. All right, so we'll start at the very beginning here. Uh, we have our two different roots of the facial nerve, somatic motor root and nervous intermedius, are going to enter into the internal acoustic meatus, where they will join together to form a single bundle that's called the facial nerve. This will then travel through a long bony canal that's called the facial canal. As it approaches the middle ear cavity or the tympanic cavity, it's gonna make sort of a 90 degree turn and run along the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. Where it makes that turn, it also drops off one of its uh, branches. So here's a quick look at the middle ear cavity. Um, so the middle ear cavity, your doctors always look in your ears when you go to get a physical. This is what they can actually see in there. 
Uh, and this is our tympanic membrane, and the tympanic membrane is really thin, so you can kind of see into it. So this white structure here is one of our middle ear ossicles, that's the malleus, which sits right up against the tympanic cavity. And a couple of branches of the facial nerve are going to pass into, uh, and one is going to pass totally through the tympanic. Again, our branch that drops off and heads uh, sort of superiorly is the greater petrosal. And if you remember back from the skull lab, uh, where we had that hiatus and groove, the greater petrosal nerve that people had a hard time finding. So after the facial nerve goes into this bony canal, the greater petrosal exits out and goes back into the cranial fossa. This sort of 90 degree bend in the facial nerve is referred to as the genu of the facial nerve. Uh, genu means knee, so we have sort of a, just a bend in the 